Um, European culture and identity, this is a, a strange yes. continent somehow. Huh? So before we zoom into what the Brussels bubble is like, uh, it's good to look at Europe as a, as a space, Europe in time. And it's something in my job as speechwriter, which I always found important to highlight, that Europe was not born with the Treaty of Rome uh, 60 years ago. And that in Europe's history, there are other great Europeans than Jean Monnet and Robert Schumann, which some of the people in this room would vote for. Now, to maybe uh, to start off, how would you, with your broad view on, on, on Europe's long-term history, even from antiquity onward, try and define in a, in a few words the specificities of, of, of European culture as opposed to continents and cultures mm. around us, I presume? It's hard to define because uh, definitions always invite some encapsulation, some brevity, which will leave out lots of stuff leaking uh, uh, around the edges. I, I like to think of it this way. If you ask somebody about what we mean when we talk about a, a, a European culture, uh, immediately one should think about those aspects of what everybody in Europe uh, shares and, and feels that they have some inheritance in. The music, the art, the painting, the sculpture, uh, the philosophical tradition, the scientific tradition. And you think about the contributions made in all those spheres, they don't have anything to do with national boundaries, not least, of course, because national boundaries, including the ones in our near neighborhood here, are a very recent uh, origin. So we, we think about something that we all share, and in many cases, in the case, for example, of music or of painting, certainly in the case of the legacy of the history of thought in Europe, it, it's something which has no specific anchor in any one of the traditions that we might, when we think about cuisine, or we think about language, or we think about more recent political history, uh, annex to a particular part of Europe and a particular uh, people in Europe. And therefore, if one were to get up into a satellite and look down at the planet from a very far distance and a very long-term point of view, there is a great uh, comparability in a surprising way between Europe and China. Now, you look at China as a vast territory, as a geographical region, lots of different languages, uh, some important differences of uh, culture and, and cuisine in local respects, but sharing a great long common history uh, and what it is that makes somebody from Guangdong province um, a, a, as much a Chinese person as someone from Heilongjiang province, and now we're talking about somebody from Wales sharing something with somebody in Ukraine. That's a great deal of commonality. And so I think of Europe in that sense, and I think of the political and international relations history of Europe, which is produced post-Westphalia, for example, the Europe of the nation states, as being a, a temporary, historically conditioned, artificial set of arrangements, which are imposed in some ways, of course, cutting across cultural uh, connections, uh, and just really a function of our more recent history, the last five or 600 years. See, I always think in big numbers. You know, it's useful that way. Yeah, that is uh, indeed uh, useful, but it's also good to ask people whether they feel European or not. And there, there would be maybe be a difference between uh, the answers you would get in China, which is not only a, let's say, civilizational unity, but also has been a political unity as an empire, let's say, the political form of China is an empire over two and a half, three millennia. And that is one reason why people all over China identify as Chinese, not only language, but also the political center. And of course, that ha <coughs> has lacked in Europe for centuries. I, well, there we can have a discussion indeed about. I do not think that is an, an, an accident of, of history. I think the plurality of European peoples and, and nations is in a way not just as profound but is embedded 
in the civilizational space of Europe. So the distinction I would, I would make is, is between, as you said, the, the person in the satellite uh, looking down upon China and upon Europe and who can perfectly see, yes, clearly these are Europeans, whether they are in Wales or in Ukraine or in Iceland or in Portugal, or an ethnologist. Huh? Um, but the question, the political question is, relevant also for European politics and for issues we will touch upon later, is whether people themselves identify as European or not. It should be more than, let's say, a uh, scientific or uh, anthropological definition. Okay, well, they have certain alphabet, or they have a certain, which we do, and we should be proud of it, a certain vision of, of the human person, of equality between human persons. I think and also an important trade of, of European civilization. But if people do not themselves, being French or Welsh or German or Danish, identify as European, you cannot force this sentiment of identity. And that's the distinction between, between the political uh, identity and the, and the cultural one. And I think one of the, the challenges um, for Europe as a political project is to make that people understand that, yes, even if we speak all these different languages, and you speak also heel veel talen, you parlez des multiples langues ici, um, even if we speak all these different languages uh, and come from different cultures, um, we are European somehow. But that is a work, let's say, of, of education, of conviction and of experience, and it is not a prima facie experience of people's lives. Well, again, let's take the long view. You, you I think correctly identified the reason why somebody who is a citizen of China would more easily self-identify as Chinese, not necessarily ethnically, because if you look, the majority population in China is Han Chinese. I remember once when I was uh, a visiting professor in Beijing, uh, I was approached by some scholars from another department, the Department of the Theory of Knowledge. I asked me if I would give them a lecture. I said, of course, I'd be delighted. What would you like me to lecture about? And they said, we would like you to lecture on the nature and origins of consciousness. Uh, and I said, uh, pardon, uh, the origins of consciousness? What do you expect me to know about that? I'm not a biologist or, or a, a neurologist. They said, oh, uh, yes, so, you know, we research that in our department. I said, how do you research it? They said, well, we take our notebooks and so on, and we go down to the southwest of China where the Min people live. These are the people on the border of Burma. They're not nearly as evolved as we Han Chinese, so we're able to understand a much earlier phase in their evolution. <laughs> I was absolutely amazed. So you, even within the boundaries of China, you're not gonna get people uh, you know, self-identifying in an ethnic way, but they do in a citizenship and a cultural way. And of course, they share a lot in common uh, on that. So I think that the response to the, to, to the point is twofold. One is that because Europe has never succeeded so far, at any rate, in a sufficient degree of unity, and I, I don't necessarily mean you know, US-style federal unity, but a sufficient degree of unity for long enough to develop that kind of self-identification. To ask the question that you asked, which is, do people think of themselves as European, is in a way the wrong question. Again, let us look from our, our historical satellite. In the period of the Roman Empire, in the period of the, the high period of Christendom, let us say up until the 16th century, in the late medieval period, uh, in the Holy Roman Empire of the central states of, of Europe, the German-speaking states, uh, in the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire, in all, all these different um, larger scale groupings in European history, that question wouldn't be answerable because until very recently, the concept of, of Europe was, as Bismarck had it, just a geographical concept. It wasn't a, a cultural concept at all. And with the unifications of uh, uh, Germany and of Italy in the 19th century, the rise of nationalism, you know, nationalism is an appalling uh, political version of romanticism. We all love romantic music and poetry and so on, but romantic politics, well, I mean, they've been the source of terrible problems just in the last century and a half. And it's in the last century and a half that what, what, what happened after Westphalia with the emergence of the nation states has turned the nation state into a sometimes nationalistically self-identified state and has made the question 
which 200 or 400 or 1,000 years ago be uh, unaskable because it wouldn't make sense to anybody, do you feel like a European? No, the people would have said, well, I feel like a Christian or I feel like a, um, a member of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Or, but just in two cases, the French and the English, they would have had some kind of sense of national identity, but not very many other places in Europe, I don't think. Well, I, th I think the, the idea that Europe is more than just a space, which is, of course already was a Greek notion, eh? Europe was, was where defined against the, the space of Asia and Africa. So that goes back more than two and a half millennium. But in the European Middle Ages, already around eight, nine hundred, a thousand, the word Europe moved from space to, to people. Eh? In, in ancient manuscripts, uh, people speak about Europeans. For instance, in the, in the, um, in the battle sh um, fought in the 8th century against the Arabs, uh, no coincidence, presumably, at Poitiers, eh? which was uh, basically the start also of French literature, the Chanson de Roland. Uh, it's, it's spoken of the rear guard of Europeans, European Nances or something like that. Well, my, my Latin is, is, uh, is rusty. Um, so that identification um, is very old. In a way, it was identical or with being Christian, not necessarily in the religious sense, but, but Europe was the space where Christianity uh, had um, gained uh, uh, food, as it were, and and I think the really the um, the historic rupture then is is more the year 1500 eh, when we, you get into the the era of of discoveries of other continents, uh, the battle um, within, and then the European unity between Catholics and Protestants is also broken with, as is celebrated or regretted, depending on where you stand this year, huh? 500 years ago, Luther, start of the uh, Protestant Reformation, that really teared up the, 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 the unity, which you spoke about rightly, of, of European uh, slash Christian, but let's say European civilization. And to somebody like, like, like Erasmus, uh, a great humanist, um, that, that event, of, of the end of the unity of, of Europe and of, of Christianity, to him it, it was as dramatic and as dreadful as basically the fall of Rome and the sack of Rome in the fourth century. So that means that it was already quite a, a of course, uh, Erasmus is a member of the elite, uh, but, but still a deep sense of, 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 of historic uh, identity and unity. And um, Coming more to, 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 to contemporary debates, I, I think it is unproductive to sort of oppose the nation states and what they have offered in terms of identity and belonging and the plurality of Europe's organization and Europe as a unity. I think, um, well, take you mentioned uh, England and France. They have always measured each other against each other, huh? like Siamese twins almost in, 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 in European history, and they have um, identified as, as European in, in that space. So I think we, we should really get out of this um, opposition that you can only be European if you step out, your, out of your nation state. Huh? Uh, you can only, uh, Brussels here, European politics can only be strong if the capitals shut up. I know that feeling from having worked uh, inside the Brussels machinery as well, but I think it's a mistake. Because if, if that is the opposition, if, if Europe can only flourish politically um, by um, basically squeezing national identities and national democracies and political systems, then we, the Europeans, will lose the battle, I'm, I'm quite sure. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because the forces of nationalism will in that case be stronger than, than these of, of Europeaners. Mm. Of course, one, one must remember that right up until the 18th century anyway, when uh, the University of Halle in Germany decided to teach in the vernacular instead of in Latin, um, almost any educated person could travel anywhere in Europe speaking, uh, writing, understanding Latin. So cultured people, educated people, authors, right up, right up till that late period, felt that they were part of one great community. And um, it was like a sort of, uh, you know, Europe of, of the devolved regions <laughs> in those days because peasants and, uh, and working people tended not to travel very much unless they were in the Navy or the Army, the occasional war. They were highly localized and uh, in, indeed the, uh, the great diversity of um, patois of different languages, even within a single language group, um, meant that your neighbors 15 miles away could be unintelligible to you. But the, the people who carried the culture of Europe through the centuries were people who felt that they were part of one story and they spoke one language. That's, that's a remarkable fact about them. By the time the 20th century uh, came round, well, the consciousness about the contrast between Europe and everywhere else had really become very embedded. I don't know whether you've read Elias Canetti's uh, autobiographical writings, but in the first of them, where he talks about his childhood, he was brought up uh, in Ruschuk in Bulgaria on the banks of the Danube. And his family would, when they go to the dentist or go to buy clothes or shoes or whatever, they would go upriver, up the Danube to Vienna to do this. And when they did so, they didn't say, we're going to Vienna. They would say, we're going to Europe. And this is because the dividing line, the border, was the old border between the Ottoman Empire and Europe. Right the way through the Balkans, and of course it's left a terrible legacy in the Balkans, but Europe ended not at the Bosphorus, or not, not in Anatolia, but it ended where the old Ottoman border ran through the Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian lines. And it's fascinating that it's a surprise to read somebody writing less than 100 years ago talking about going from Bulgaria to uh, Austria as going to Europe. It gives you a sense that, that the, the full consciousness of where, where things were culturally, where, where in cultural space, things belonged and the right labels attached uh, had, had by that time become something that I think in the 16th, 17th, even early 18th century, well, maybe by the 18th century things were different, but certainly up to the end of the 17th century, educated people would still think that they were part of a, an, an extended arrangement. Very much like France and England up until the 15th century. After all, they were regarded as a single kingdom for a very long time by the competing kings. <laughs> who laid claim to the inheritance because it was a family squabble. Well, I think that this, this example of, uh, of going from Bulgaria to Europe brings to mind also that, of course, the space that is considered European culturally has also uh, moved over time. I mean, the, the process of Europeanization um, which in a way also started in the Middle Ages, but just think of Russia, for instance. Huh? Uh, one thinks of St. Petersburg as a city which is more European than Moscow is, huh? just as taking Turkey, Istanbul is more European than, uh, than Ankara is. And, um, and perhaps huh? one day, it was the idea at least in the past, huh? Moscow and Ankara could be become as European as uh, the cities to the west. So, so there is also this, this dimension in European culture that it can uh, spread. And it is not inscribed on, uh, on, the, on the ground, on the soil, but it is part of a, of a historic movement and is worth spreading, which is, by the way, an idea that is in a different manner also uh, deeply inscribed in the European political project. Huh? The whole idea of, of enlargement, as it is uh, uh, called, this ugly term, of course, uh, but is also the idea, okay, we, we start something, we become even more European, we become a political Europe within the cultural European space, and that's an idea that should also expand and, and uh, enlarge itself. So I think should always keep in mind that these things are, are, are fluid and um, 
but I and hear of course from they, they can be fluid in the wrong way. Yeah. Because I, I mean, one great worry that we should all have really is the uh, tendency, and it, it always exists for little forms of nationalism, whether it's in Catalonia or in Scotland or wherever it might be, to, to, to surge up. I mean, for, for example, you think people here who love music, so you love Brahms, you love Tchaikovsky, you love Beethoven, you love uh, Schubert, and so on. Then you think about um, Vojak and Smetana, you, think, you don't think music, you think Czech music, <laughs> because this music is associated with a, a period in Bohemian and, and uh, uh, Slovakian history where a very powerful nationalistic consciousness was rising. And for that reason, everybody, the writers, the poets, and the composers, were trying to emphasize the national character that distinguished them from the Austrians or people elsewhere in the, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and it's a little oddity, that one. It's a little hangover in our cultural uh, terms of how sometimes nationalism can, can reach into areas of culture where we, we, we don't worry about them because they're not political, but which give us a little warning bell that the, these nationalistic impulses can have an unfortunate effect, and maybe Brexit is an example of that as well. But we should guard against it. Yes, of course, but uh, the, there's also, uh, let's say, a competitive element in, 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 in uh, well, not in nationalism, but in, in national pride. I mean, European kings, they all wanted to build the most beautiful castle and, and the most beautiful palaces and gardens. And um, so there was a, also between, between England and France, a kind of play as well, um, where, because everybody was nationalistic, they were competing with each other, and in the end, they all did the same thing because they all built the same uh, palaces, uh, like Louis XIV had them, or the same. Uh, they had the same chamber music as was played in this room as well. Um, so again, I want to, to nuance this this uh, opposition between either nationalism or Europe. No, uh, nationalism, in a way, has also been a factor, paradoxically, of of of, of unification. And um, I think if you look at it that way, it, it, it is, um, it's more easy to, to, to identify, let's say, with uh, European history as a whole, without singling out uh, black and white uh, eras, wh when things went wrong or when things went well. I think we, we should be able to to take it, to accept it, to acknowledge what has preceded us. Um, because it's also the only way, of course, to, to, to organize then our thinking and acting towards a, a joint future. Let me ask you about that then, because um, th there is a, a view taken by political theorists uh, that the state, the nation state, is the natural uh, organism for dealing with the aspirations, the problems, the management of, of people, of the kinds of institutions they require, health services, education, defense, and the like. And that this, this what has emerged uh, by the process of political evolution is a, a solution that works to the sorts of demands and problems that uh, groups of people find themselves facing. Firstly, do you, do you agree with, with that? view, the, the, the view that's, that defends the idea of the nation state as the, the best and most natural organism for dealing with those things. And secondly, if you do, um, do you think that that should be the terminus ad quem of the European project? No, on the, on the first question, I mean, just looking at the world as it is, it seems that most peoples, or people in the sense of, of, uh, of, of, of tribes and, and group of people who do not have a state, suffer from it. Hmm? Be it the Kurds, or the Palestinians, and there are many others in the world who feel they share a cultural or ethnic or linguistic identity and they lack a state. And they have come to the conclusion that in order to be taken seriously in the world as it is, a world of sovereign states, they also want to be a state. And um, membership of the United Nations, in a way, is, is 
well, is, is as being uh, playing in the Champions League for, for football teams is where you want to be. Huh? And I take that as a, as a fact. And I, I think it is also for, for reasons that this statehood has um, come to, to embody this mix of offering indeed protection and a whole load of, of um, let's say, public services and, and an, an idea of a, of a collective identity, ideally with a democracy as well. I do not say that, let's say, in the uh, Hegelian sense of this is really the purpose of world history, or as Fukuyama later, uh, uh, who was just repeating Hegel, uh, said, maybe there will be other things later. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't know, uh, and I do not exclude it. But, so I do not think that this is the logical end point of world history since, since Plato or since the Old Testament, right? But the fact being that statehood is what the system tends to, now comes your second question, where does this leave Europe or let's the, the, the project of political unity of Europe? Well, there are different, many different views about this for, for ages already. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, the idea of the United States of Europe, les États-Unis d'Europe, was already expressed by Victor Hugo. Um, Personally, but it's it's personal view, but rooted, let's say, in my conviction of what history has brought. I do not think that Europe will, let's say, within the next 50 years, uh, looking further than that doesn't make much sense. So within all our lifetimes, those who are here assembled, Europe will not be a state, I think, in the sense of the United States of America. Brussels will not be Washington. Big disappointment, <laughs> enormous disappointment, but it will not happen because it does not, that vision of the United States of Europe does not correspond precisely to the two and a half millennia of European history that went beforehand and where um, we have always, we Europeans strive to find this balance between unity which we feel that we share, which we experience and the plurality of our political institutions. And I think that the greatness of the European Union, as it is, is that it's a place where this tension between unity and identity becomes, in a way, productive. And if you try to solve the tension, as it were, to take it away, um, you will not get very far and it will break up the system. And, um, well, we could go into more institutional detail, but that is not necessary, I think. But it does not mean that Europe cannot be more, the European Union cannot be more robust and cannot be, do better what it's doing. But it will do so, as it has done in the past 60 years, in inventing other forms, sometimes unexpected ones and, 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 and fascinating ones. I mean, they, they fascinate me, at least but we should not model it upon the United States of America, A, for reasons of substance, because it, it doesn't fit, and then also we can say entre nous, huh? for reasons of tactics, because it scares the hell out of too many people. And, and I think both reasons in themselves uh, are, are, are good enough, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to make the case on, on grounds of substance alone, but I also think there's, there's a tactical element there, and, and the talk about the United States of Europe, perhaps except for Belgium and Luxembourg, a little bit Germany, but in more than 20 other member states of the European Union, it, it, it works uh, as a boomerang. So it, uh, well, I, I agree with you. Um, I think the next 50 years is unlikely to see that, but I'm also conscious of the fact that uh, if we get back up into our historical satellite, things change much more rapidly and attitudes change. You know, things reach a tipping point and then there's a kind of cascade effect afterwards where change becomes very natural. I mean, again, uh, we, we, we tend to think in terms of the, the stasis that we either experience or desire in our lives and in current arrangements. But let's look at this part of the world here. 
Belgium as a state is, uh, you know, coming up to... Now you have to be very careful. Oh, I, I, okay. I, I say this as a foreigner myself in Belgium. I'm, I'm, I'm Dutch, but you have to be very careful. Okay. When you talk. The following remarks are made by a naive amateur visitor. Okay, so don't, I'm not treading on any corns or anything, but um, I suppose everybody would agree it's an historical fact that the, the, the state of Belgium um, is coming up to its second centenary uh, in the next couple of decades, isn't that right? So it's uh, the 1830s. Uh, that it has uh, some parts of it, at any rate, have a connection with Spain for a very long time beforehand. So from our historical um, satellite, we can see that, you know, in, in historical timescales that are relevant to self perceptions, identity, greatest great changes of um, political order. Uh, things move faster than, than you expect. Also, the analogies uh, are very interesting to look at. If you look at the United States of America, if you look at the um, states' rights debates that very often happen, at the very different character of different states, if you look at the slightly semi-detached nature of Texas with, in relation to the rest of the United States, um, at the fact that monetary union you know, uh, only occurred in the second half of the 19th century in the United States, we're looking at examples which are relatively recent, experiences which are not irrelevant to how we think about what the prospects might be here. And it may very well be that because of the very richness of texture of European culture, not, not you know, its political history, but of European culture, that if Europe were ever at any point in the next century or two centuries to become much, much more politically integrated, it would have to be on a, a basis that really respected the, as it were, um, sharp articulations of, of uh, uh, European sensibility, despite the fact that that European sensibility shares so much in the way of uh, a long, continuous history and, and, and a, very, uh, a very deep uh, cultural background so that it would probably never quite look like the United States of America, even if functionally it had institutions and practices and so on that were very similar. So it, it will never be a United States of Europe in the sense in which the United States of America is the United States, but as it seems to me, the dynamic of history drives towards greater cooperation, greater unity, ultimately greater integration certainly of institutions, uh, of a legal and economic order. Um, and that fact by itself will change people's minds, change the way that people feel about where they belong and what they do. So as no. you see, I'm an optimist. People ask me why I'm an optimist. I say, what's the alternative? Jump off a high building. That's the alternative to being an optimist. Uh, no, perhaps uh, I, 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 uh, I can relate to that, and I, I agree that, that we have a natural tendency to underestimate historic change because we, we, we think that things will remain as they are and if you think, uh, only think of your own lifetime, so much unexpected has happened and so many things have been set into motion that um, we really don't know what the world will look like in, in 5, 10 or 20 years from now. Perhaps we should switch and, and if, uh, if you allow me to, to get into, from Belgium into the United Kingdom, huh? another, another, uh, one kind of pain. To another a political, a political entity on the European continent, with its own fissures uh, and its own um, composed identity. Do you think, uh, I think that that uh, the United Kingdom, as a United Kingdom, will survive the exit from the European Union? Well, of course, that uh, depends upon whether there is an exit from the European Union, because it may surprise some, people, uh, surprise some people here to know that I think it's not impossible that Brexit won't happen. Uh, very complicated reasons. There are lots of different things happening, lots of tentacles and strands, and uh, the very complexity of the process. And if you listen to the, the, if you listen to between the lines, there's a mixed metaphor for you. If you read between the lines of what politicians are saying in this election campaign now, and you hear to the backstories and so on, uh, you get the sense that um, the next two years, and probably longer because the next two years will in part anyway have discussions about how to lengthen the process of negotiations. The um, sentiment... Yeah, uh, you're great delayers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sentiment will change, attitudes will change, there's a YouGov poll for the Times newspaper today 
which says that people who uh, think it was a bad idea to Brexit is now more than the people who thought that it was a good idea. In fact, that's not surprising because there's always been a pro-Remain majority in, in the UK. And what you were witnessing, um, and I don't really like to put it this way because it makes, begins to make it sound as though I'm some kind of conspiracy theorist, so I'm not at all, but actually what you're witnessing in the UK is a kind of coup you know, of the p people on the right who've been working very, very hard to try to get something, get their screwdriver into the crack somehow, uh, found their chance with uh, a, um, a very pleasant but lazy, inattentive Prime Minister, uh, um, Cameron, and they found their chance to uh, have a, a referendum. And if you, if you just trace, if you just follow the paper trail, um, you should be outraged uh, by, by what you see. Let me give you just a small example, if I may. I begin to rant at this point, okay? But <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, David Cameron promised the Tory right a referendum on EU membership to shut them up. It was an internal Conservative Party matter. It had nothing to do with any problem with Europe or with the EU or anything about our relationship with the EU. There was no emergency. There was no need for it. But ever since uh, the UK has been part of the EU, successive Conservative Prime Ministers have been given absolute hell by their right wing, which of course then formed the sort of stormtrooper version, which was the UKIP. Um, and you may remember back in the early 90s, uh, John Major using some very unparliamentary language. He called his UKIP, his Eurosceptic colleagues, bastards, because they were giving him such a difficult time. Now to shut them up during the time of the coalition government, Cameron promised them a referendum. He didn't think he was going to win the next election. He certainly didn't think he was going to get a majority in the next election. He was more surprised than anybody else. He was like a dog that chases after a car and catches it. What does a dog do with it when it catches it? Well, there he is. He's you know, got to form a government, and he's stuck with a, a manifesto promise that he's got to have a referendum. So the way that... Yeah, I, sorry, I remember one Cameron advisor saying at the time it was a nice problem to have yeah. <laughs> because well, they hadn't expected to win the election. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, now, if you go to the documents, uh, you know, a white paper was published on the referendum bill. Of course, most members of parliament are too lazy to read the white paper. So what the House of Commons Library does is it produces a, a summary explaining what the bill is and what the implications are. And this summary was a House of Commons briefing paper published on the 3rd of June, 2015. Briefing paper 07212. It's on the internet. You can read it for yourself. This paper said, in terms, in paragraph five, it said, this ref the referendum uh, that this bill will set up is advisory only. It is not binding on the government and it's not binding on parliament. Paragraph five. Paragraph six. If there were any suggestion otherwise, if anybody was gonna think this was mandating or it should be acted upon, you need to think about a, a super majority. Let me just take you back to the fact that in 1979, the devolution referendum for Scotland, uh, the referendum bill said 40%, at least 40% of the total electorate must agree to this, otherwise uh, it doesn't happen. As it happened on the day, there was a majority for devolution in Scotland, 51.4% or something like that. Uh, it might have even been more than that. But because it wasn't 40% of the electorate, it didn't happen. But no barrier, no bar, no break clause, nothing was put into the referendum bill. And this was advertised to MPs in the briefing paper. On the 15th or 16th of June 2015, it's in Hansard for one of those days, the Minister for Europe, a man called uh, uh, Lidlington, said, don't, well, we don't need to put in any protections here. This is only advisory. It's not going to bind on anybody. Immediately, that 37% of the enfranchised electorate, and by the way, that was a restricted electorate because they didn't, and Cameron has told us that the right objected to the idea of having 16 and 17 year olds, EU citizens and expats, okay? So it was a restricted franchise and if those people had been given the vote, there would have been no problem. There would have been a pretty considerable Remain majority. So on the restricted franchise, 37% of the electorate voted for leave. In no mature constitutional uh, polity is that anywhere near sufficient to mandate a massive constitutional change like leaving the EU. And yet, uh, Cameron resigned. That nobody wanted the, the hot potato, so Theresa May, who's a very, you know, blah, 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 became prime minister. 
Who did she appoint? She appointed this uh, uh, people like David Davis and Liam Fox. Anybody here knows any recent political history of the UK will know that these jokers used to be ministers who got sacked for incompetence. Some people have thought, oh, well, maybe that means Theresa May is very smart. She's put these completely useless people in charge of Brexit, so it won't happen. But I, I, I don't think she was that, that clever, really. But anyway, so, so they, under the impulse, because there is a group of people and they include people like Jacob Rees-Mogg and others who know exactly why they want a Brexit. And you can ask me, who benefits? Cui bono? Who benefits? Who wants a Brexit? Because most of the people um, in, in the UK who voted leave were, and you know this from the nature of the absolutely disgraceful campaign that was run by leave, with a whole lot of false promises and lies and distortions and 350 million pounds a week, the NHS, all that kind of thing, the, the different groups some of them anti-immigration, some of them worried about employment, some of them with some vague dream of sovereignty, whatever that meant. And by the way, the white paper that was published for the Article 50 debate, of course, this being Theresa May's government after the debate, in fact, at seven minutes past 4 a.m. in the morning after the debate, uh, a, a very sketchy piece of work, had in it, and you can read it, section two, paragraph one, it says, this great hot potato issue in the leave referendum, which was sovereignty, taking back control. It says, of course, we've always had sovereignty. And I'm now going to quote to you what the next sentence says. It said, but it sometimes felt as if we didn't. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to ask you, I mean, if you, if you look at the arguments and you look at the documents and you look at the paper, you see that what is happening in the UK is that against the wishes of the majority of the population there, 26% of the population voted to leave the EU. There is absolutely no political legitimacy to Brexit and there is a lot of in constitutional impropriety about it as well. And since that, you know, b b b before um, the uh, day of the vote, 23rd of June last year, most people who were passionate about Europe or who were just Europeans or just wanted, thought we were gonna be in Europe forever, didn't really make a big noise about it, you know, what the British are like, the weather, football, and so on. So there wasn't much talk about the EU. But my golly, you go and talk to people who were Remainers, who woke up sick to their stomach the next morning when they saw what had happened in the, in the referendum. And you would be surprised at how strong the feeling is. The Remainer campaign in the UK is growing, growing stronger, more vociferous. It's sustaining itself. I go around the country talking to uh, groups and, in, in different towns and cities, to big audiences. Four, five hundred, six hundred people. Angry people, disappointed, dismayed people. A lot of people with a lot of experience of business in Europe. With so, Sorry, I'm going on and on. No, no, I'm going to ask you, how, how would you channel this energy uh, ahead of the next general election? Because, I mean, uh, the, the referendum of the 23rd of June is a political fact. Maybe it doesn't have... Uh, Legally speaking, it wasn't binding, but I mean, that has happened before. I come from a, from a country which twice had a non-binding consultory referendum on European issues, treaty and recently uh, Ukraine association agreement where the Dutch also voted against. Once the vote is out, it is politically binding. So then you have to create another political fact, which is more powerful, which can overturn it. More powerful if only because it's later, because it comes after. Huh? Um, for now, it seems that uh, nobody is, is reeling in Parliament carrying the torch of, of Remain in a, let's say, in, a, in an incredible, flashing, whamming manner, ready to, to knock out Theresa May's government. Uh, I don't have to spell out to you, but Labour is, 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 is nowhere in this respect, and, and the Lib Dems are not a mighty parliamentary force not before the general elections, maybe a little bit stronger after the general election, but then it will be too late. So all this energy in the country, who, how will it be mobilized and canalized to stop it? Now that's my question. Then I will say my, my fear, let's say, is, um, I mean, obviously I, I fully sympathize and I always also think that it, if only there's five or 10% chance for Brexit, to be overturned for the UK to revert course, we should fight for it. Huh? Um, personally, I do not think it's much more than 10%, but I'm, I would fight for it, so I, I, I would do like you. But why do I think um, 
it will be perhaps difficult. Why, why, why is the 90% so, 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 so big? Because the, the trouble, the economic and political trouble of Brexit will, at least in the current calendar, only come when it's too late. So the economic downturn, which was uh, predicted and which did not come true and which had Brexiteers gloating where, uh, where is the economic collapse, which is nowhere to be seen, that will come, definitely. Brexit is a disaster. We don't have to explain that to this, uh, this audience. But it will come after you're out, I think. Uh, th that is my fear. And once you're out, um, and I say this again as an amateur observer as of, of the British psychology, once you are out, you will not come back and knock at the door again. Huh? The Brits are okay. proud people. And, no, no, and, no, no, and so then must, you... Uh, no, no, I'll just push back uh, uh, <laughs> on some of those things. Yeah, yeah first, please. That's, firstly, that's, that's why... Yeah, yeah, that, sure, sure. That's why first, we talk. For, firstly, it's a much, much, much better chance at 10% that we can stop Brexit or that Brexit won't happen. Um, the, 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 this election, this general election, is actually an irrelevance. It, it, we almost certainly will see an increased number of seats for the Tory party. This is because Labour is in complete meltdown. Made a terrible mistake in choosing his party leader. I'm sorry if there are any sensitivities being uh, upset here. But this is an election that Labour will lose rather than the Conservatives will win, or it will be a combination of both. But it is an irrelevance because e even, even in a, uh, a Conservative-dominated um, House of Commons over the next two years, there will still be a majority of Remainer MPs. I mean, the, the, the majority of Remainer MPs in this current parliament is, is considerable. Complicated reasons why they went with the um, triggering Article 50 and you know, uh, voted for uh, uh, an election this time, and by, by one of these wonderful ironies, in order for the British Parliament to dissolve itself and have a general election out of the five-year parliamentary term, they have to have a 66% majority of all seats in the House of Commons to do it. So they have heard of supermajorities before now, okay? <laughs> So, um, the, you, you know, you, you quote uh, uh, um, uh, Macmillan in your book saying events, events. And Harold Wilson said a week is a long time in politics. The uh, effects of, um, on the economy of Brexit, the, even the mere threat of Brexit, are already very apparent. Businesses relocating or looking to relocate, banks talking about moving. Uh, investment very, very sharply down already, and this is before Brexit has happened and just in prospect of it. I was, I was at a meeting of, a, of a, uh, at a, an Italian uh, entrepreneur's thing. Uh, I sometimes get invited as a professor of philosophy to talk about business ethics. The more badly corporations behave, the more they like to invite people to come and talk about ethics. So I, it's a nice little sideline. And I was giving a disc uh, one of these talks at a business conference in Italy uh, late last year, and a lot of the businesses there were saying on the day after the referendum, of course, for contingency planning purposes, they had to go and look and see where else in Europe they might relocate since all their business is there. What did they find? Very nice, good infrastructure, nice uh, employees, um, lower rents. They said, we'll move anyway. I mean, wh whether there's Brexit or not, we're going to go. You know? it was about and there was a Chinese businessman there, somebody who had literally hundreds of millions invested in the UK who said, the UK is the door to Europe. If there's no Europe, it's a door to nowhere. And you can bet your bottom dollar that anybody who invests large sums of money or thinks about businesses and so on are not going to be investing in the UK, are not going to be putting their businesses in the UK unless the UK becomes what the, the real hardline Brexiters want. Low tax, no regulation, offshore economy, which is really what they want because it will benefit them. But you read today the party manifestos. And both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party are now saying, we want a deep, special relationship with Europe. Well, when I read that this morning on the train coming over here, I tweeted, oh, it's called membership of the EU. I mean, it's worth doing, remember. <laughs> but what, 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 it, uh, what it suggests to me is that they are starting to ratchet back. That what they're both hoping they can do is to persuade the, our EU partners to say to them, look, let us pretend to leave, you know, it's a sort of a kind of a semi, sort of a nearly a Brexit, you know, 
in a revolving door so we can say, oh, we Brexited, but actually we're still part of the customs union and the single market and the European Court of Justice and blah, 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 which is why I say, and the, the Remain campaign says, look, you guys, you Brexiters, you're wasting our time. You're giving us wasted years. You're already causing a lot of damage and problems in, in the UK. So we're going to try and stop it to limit the amount of damage. But if you do manage to drag us out, even if it's on a fudge basis, we will just work to get back in. You talk about not wanting to knock on the door. You can. You, you need to come. You need to come visit me. Actually, I think, <laughs> Luke. I'm just, I'll take you around to some I'm of these just, meetings. You I'm just there people challenging you to 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 to, huh? yeah, yeah, to okay. get you on pace. You, you but, will uh, see they will be uh, ready to knock on that door, climb through the window, make a, dr well, a tunnel I, underneath to get back in, and they will. They will. We will. Don't I, worry, folks. We'll be back. <laughs> Yeah, there's this funny English expression of yeah, go saying on. your goodbyes in the plural. So you tend to take a long time if you stand on the door, in the doorway, leaving. Huh? It's a whole ceremony. Oh, oh, and that, that, I think you will, nice you will indeed it. Play, play it out over time. It yeah. may take years. And in the end, uh, we'll see at what side of the door you will end. There's also one uh, joke in, here in these circles here which, which says that, uh, yeah, you know, it doesn't really matter. UK was always with one food within the EU and with the other food outside. The only thing that will happen is we will change foods. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, there's a very nice word for what you just described. It's called vestibulating. This is being in the vestibule but never quite leaving or taking a long time to leave. Yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs>